Family, before I go ahead and begin my talk or my introduction, I just want to quickly say it off the top of my mind as I sat there next to my wife. As I was sitting amongst highly sophisticated individuals on this stage and being present in front of you folks today, out of all the stages and platforms I've been on throughout my powerlifting or bodybuilding journey, this is by far got to be the biggest stage I've ever been on. I want to thank my wife for the opportunity to be here. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, aloha. aloha. My name is Isaac Silva, and I'm here in support of my beautiful and loving wife, whom I've had the pleasure of knowing since my junior year at Kahuku High School. My wife has been nothing short of amazing. It's because of her, and with the help of our Heavenly Father, of course, that my family and I can live the life that we are currently living today. We have four children together, three daughters and a son. My oldest daughter is, in, is currently a sixth grade teacher over at Hula Elementary School in the Hawaiian Language Immersion Program. My second oldest daughter is attending college at the Southern California State of University. Two highly educated individuals whom I'm blessed to have as my daughters. And of course, I have nothing to do with that as they get their knowledge and education from their mother. My youngest daughter is currently a sophomore at Kahuku High School and my son is attending second grade at Hawaii Elementary. Brothers and sisters, roughly six months ago, in March of 2023, my wife did the unthinkable. As beautiful as she is, as you can see, highly educated, a loving mother and wife, and a really awesome cook, as you can see. <laughs> she competed in her first ever powerlifting meet and won first place in the raw bench press competition. With the passion and desire to become a record holder, she competed in her second powerlifting meet in Hilo back in July and became the women's submasters champion and captured the Hawaii state record. I could not be more prouder of her and her accomplishments. However, despite those powerlifting records, she will say that her greatest achievement is being able to raise an eternal gospel-centered family. And I'm truly blessed to have her as my wife and the mother of my children. Brothers and sisters, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the most amazing person in my life, my wife, Rachel Ripeka Lelani Kekaula. My dear brothers and sisters, aloha. I feel so grateful and humbled for this opportunity to address our University Ohana at this devotional. I'd also like to thank our musical performers for that number. That's actually my, my favorite hymn, and it really worked to soothe and ground me with my anxiety right now. I've sat in the very seat you are sitting in for many years, both as a student and as a staff member. The different perspectives between sitting in the audience versus sitting or standing at this podium is a stark contrast. The view from this vantage point is a beautiful sight. To witness the gathering of diverse peoples from across the world in this space with the common, purp the common purpose to become lifelong learners, leaders, and disciples is a miracle and a testament to President McKay's prophetic vision. In fact, as I prepared for this talk and reflected on my experiences, I realized that I am working to fulfill the university mission in my life. About 20 years ago, I was once where you were. I had the same sparkle in my eyes and, enth and enthusiasm I see on your faces. One day, you will be where I am. In the years ahead, you will be leading families, communities, professional fields, and the church. Perhaps one day, even standing at this very podium. As President Kawe shared in last week's devotional, the small and simple things will prepare and qualify you for your final finest hour. Every day, make conscious decisions that improve your well-being and bring you closer to our Heavenly Father. 
The choice you made to attend devotional today is a step in the right direction. Keep going. On the days you struggle and falter, get back up. Recalibrate and keep going. Sometimes those days may turn to weeks, and weeks turn to months. Know that it is never too late to change course and return to the light of Christ. As Elder Holland said, however late you think you are, however many, however many chances you think you've missed, however many mistakes you feel you've made or talents you think you don't have, or distance from home and family and God, you feel you have traveled. I testify that you have not traveled beyond the reach of divine love. It is not possible for you to sink lower than the infinite light of Christ's atonement shines. I stand before you a culmination of all those who have come before me. I would be amiss if I did not honor and acknowledge them. I bring to this space my kupuna, my ancestors who have come before me and have paid the path that led me here today. I come from a long line of manavahine, strong women who I glean strength and grit from. My tutuma, Dora Machado, my paternal grandmother, Rose Kahai Machado, my maternal grandmother, Ripeka Brown, and my mother, Merania Mikaide Kekaula. I also bring to this space my kumu, teachers that imparted their knowledge of indigenous epistemology and have shaped my worldview. I'm grateful for my parents. I'm grateful for my husband, my eternal companion, my best friend. I'm grateful for our children. They are my why. And most importantly, I'm grateful for my Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ and the blessing of life. I acknowledge their hand in all that I have and do. I wish to speak with you today about a key component in your decision-making process, which determines the outcomes in your life. That key is your thoughts. The scriptures say, as the man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. This gospel truth is essentially the pre premise of an evidence-based treatment modality in therapy. Our thoughts influence our emotions, which in turn drive our actions and choices. Thoughts, emotions, actions, choices. The choices we make, even the simple ones on a day-to-day -day basis, ultimately determine our lives. This gospel truth is a premise of a treatment modality. If you can change the way you think, you can change the way you feel. You can change your behaviors, which determine the outcomes in your life. While growing up, I was told many times to control my thoughts or to stop thinking a certain way. But no one told me how. One of my favorite prophets of my youth was President Boyd K. Packer. As a child, President Packer grew up surrounded by an orchard. One day, he was working on irrigating the orchard. The rows were overgrown with weeds, and soon the finite supply of water began to flood in every direction. He frantically worked in the puddles to shore up the bank, but just as soon as one was patched, another one broke. A neighbor came by, watched for a moment, and then with a few strokes of the shovel, cleared the ditch and allowed the water to course through the channel he made. The neighbor said, if you want the water to stay in its course, you have to make a place for it to go. 
President Packer likened thoughts to the water. Thoughts will stay on course if we make a place for them to go. Otherwise, thoughts follow the course of least resistance, always seeking the lower levels. Learning to control your thoughts is easier said than done. Probably one of the hardest things you'll learn to do. But President Packer reminds us that as we learn to control our thoughts, we can overcome habits, gain courage, conquer fear, and have a happy life. President Packer eloquently said, the mind is a stage. At every moment, the curtain is up and some act is always being performed on that stage. At times, and often without intention, shady little thoughts try to creep in from the wings and attempt to upstage all other thoughts. If you permit them to continue, those thoughts will command your attention and you will be left to the influence of those thoughts, to the point where they become intolerable and are eventually acted upon. Perhaps the relevant comparison for these modern times and for our millennials and Gen Zers is, the mind is like a screen. Your mind is constantly processing an endless stream of information. As you scroll, the thoughts you entertain get programmed into your cognitive algorithm, and you will continue to have more thoughts of the similar content. Additionally, vulgar and immoral clickbait and pop-ups constantly bombard your screen. Just like the stage, you can choose what content you choose to entertain. You can choose to click on them or swipe them away. How do you control your thoughts? The skill takes intentional practice and effort. And, just like a muscle, the more you exercise it, the stronger it becomes. Controlling your thoughts is the capability to influence, direct, and exercise restraint over those thoughts. Control doesn't necessarily mean you can stop, resist, or preventing a thought from occurring. Some thoughts are automatic, and others are intrusive. In some cases, trying to resist a thought may actually be counterintuitive, as more attention is given to the thought and more anxiety builds around it. Let's test this theory together. In your mind's eye, I'd like you to picture a pink elephant. Are you visualizing a pink elephant? Now that you are thinking about a pink elephant, I'd like you to place that pink elephant somewhere in this center. The pink elephant can be seated across the room, or you can even imagine it sitting here on my palm. Now, stop thinking about the pink elephant. Remove the pink elephant, the image of the pink elephant, from your mind. Have you stopped thinking about the pink elephant? Most likely not. And that's because I've suggested the thought. And the more I instruct you to stop, the more attention you give to it. Your mind is an automatic processing machine. Its job is to process information for survival. Any external stimuli will trigger thoughts. It's important to understand that thoughts are just thoughts. You need not entertain them, and you certainly do not need to act out on them. When a thought comes to your mind, whether it be unrighteous, immoral, or uncomfortable, acknowledge it. Acknowledge that it is just a thought and let it pass. Swipe it away 
or direct it off the stage. One helpful imagery exercise is called leaves on the stream. Visualize yourself sitting on the bank of a gentle, flowing stream. As unwanted thoughts come to your mind, place them on a leaf and send them floating down the stream. As you learn to direct unclean and unwanted thoughts out of your mind, you must fill the space, the space with clean and constructive thoughts. One way to do this is with worthy music. President Packer remarked, music is one of the most forceful in instruments for governing the mind. A spiritually inspiring song urges you to see yourself in a more noble perspective. Be selective with your music choices. Remember, it influences your thoughts. I encourage you, even after this devotional, to go through your playlists. Delete songs with degrading themes. If you haven't done so, create a playlist with uplifting, reverent, and worthy music. Also learn to distract your mind from unwanted thoughts by mindfully engaging in wholesome activities. Pray for help. Read the scriptures. Memorize and recite your favorite hymn or scripture. Give service. Take a walk to the temple grounds with a friend. These activities can help to distract your thoughts. We all struggle with the natural man, and President Faust explained, if not bridled, our thoughts can run wild. Learn to control your thoughts by resisting the impulse to act out on them. Swipe them away, and then distract your mind with wholesome and worthy content. Up to this point, I've discussed ways one can direct and distract from unwanted and unclean thoughts. Now, I wish to turn to a metacognitive approach to better understand what influences your thoughts and how you can reconstruct them. Let's think about thinking. In his 1985 General Conference talk, President Nelson said, before you can master yourself, you need to know who you are. You consist of two parts, your physical body and your spirit, which lives within your body. From a cognitive behavioral therapy approach, it's understood that our core beliefs, interchangeably called schemas or worldview, core beliefs influence the way we see ourselves how we relate to others, and how we relate to the world around us. Core beliefs are those underlying values and assumptions which are the lens in which we experience life through. Core beliefs are shaped during the formative years, childhood through adolescence, and primarily in our family and caregiver relationships. They are deeply ingrained, are carried on through adulthood, and influence our thinking. Applying that concept to what President Nelson said, your core beliefs about who you are, both physically and spiritually, will have a direct influence on your thinking. Each one of you has unique core beliefs based on your individual experiences. Thus, we could all witness the same event, yet your individual thoughts and your reactions would be entirely different. One day, a couple was driving down the highway. They, no they noticed a minor bird that had been hit by a car lying in the middle of the road. About two feet away, they saw two more birds standing on the side of the road. One person said, Oh, how sad. Those birds must be grieving and saying goodbye to their bird friend. 
The second person said, No, they're probably waiting to scavenge the carcass. Two extremely different responses based on the same event. One set of thoughts, possibly based on the core belief of family, with experiences with grief and loss. The second set of thoughts based on instinctual reasoning, nature and survival. Neither right nor wrong, just different, based on the individual's unique experiences and core beliefs. Your core beliefs about who you are, both physically and spiritually, will have a direct influence on your thinking. I invite you now to take a moment for self-reflection. What are your core beliefs and values? How do you see yourself, your meaning and purpose? And how does this relate to the world around you? What are those earlier experiences that shaped your core beliefs? Are your core beliefs centered in an eternal perspective? An eternal perspective will give you the answers to two very important questions. Who am I and where did I come from? The answers to these questions can be found simply and sweetly stated in Naomi Randall's hymn, I am a child of God. The hymn explains that there was a pre-existence in God's presence, and this earthly experience is the next step. We were sent here to this earthly home into families, communities, and are blessed with the opportunity to have the gift of the Holy Spirit to teach us what we must do, to understand His words, to learn His will, and to help us return to God. During the culmination of his ministry, Christ testified to his apostles about the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, saying, The Father shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Who am I? Where did I come from? You are a child of God, of divine worth and infinite potential. You lived in God's presence in the pre-existence and were sent here to his mortal, to this mortal existence to learn and grow to be more like him and to someday return to God's presence. Our Heavenly Father loves you and wants you to be happy. What are your core beliefs regarding who you are spiritually? Are your core beliefs centered in these simple eternal truths? I was born in the covenant to goodly parents who love me and provided for my physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. In these nurturing relationships, I was able to develop healthy and adaptive core beliefs about both my spiritual and physical identity. I was taught from my early years that there is a God and He loves me. I was taught those eternal truths. I was a very shy child, quiet and kept mainly to a small group of close friends. If left up to me, I probably would have stayed in the comfort of my bubble, but my parents pushed me beyond my comfort zones and encouraged me to join sports, do well in school, take leadership roles, and strive for lifelong learning. This wasn't always easy, and I failed many times, more times than I'd like to admit. But each time I failed, my parents reminded me of my strengths, told me to do better, and encouraged me to try again. These healthy experiences in my formative years helped me to develop a core belief about myself. I'm stronger than I know, and I can do hard things. 
With this core belief, I'm able to face challenges with optimism, and even when I fail, I'm a little kinder to myself. I acknowledge that not everyone is born into homes and families they deserve or have the parents, kind and dear, that our Heavenly Father intended you to have. Due to circumstances beyond your control, you may have been raised in an invalidating environment or even been exposed to trauma and abuse. Or you may even be struggling with psychological disorders like depression, addiction, or anxiety. For you, I have this message. God loves you. He sees you. He knows who you are. You are not responsible for the past, but you are responsible for your personal healing and changing your life. A quote from Family Services in a Liohona article reads, Jesus Christ has the power to heal all wounds, no matter how deep. The process of healing is difficult and may take time. In our hurt, we may even become angry with Heavenly Father. While we may not feel like turning to Him, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, the Master Healer. Through the Savior's Atonement, we can be healed over time. Turn to our Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ for hope and healing. Healing from significant emotional concerns may require professional support. We have trained licensed therapists at Counseling Services who provide confidential counseling. Be open to accepting support. Have courage. Take the first step. Part of the healing process is becoming aware of healthy core beliefs, unhealthy core beliefs that lead to maladaptive thinking, overwhelming distress, and problematic behaviors. Examples of common unhealthy core beliefs are, I'm unlovable, I'm not good enough, and I'm alone, I can't trust anyone. Functioning under these unhealthy core beliefs will make it difficult to work through life cha life's challenges establish close and healthy relationships, and to be happy. Learn to challenge and reconstruct your unhealthy core beliefs. Consider those eternal truths as you, as you define, as you work, and your divine worth as you work to change unhealthy core beliefs. Examples of healthier core beliefs are, I am loved. I have good things to offer, and people appreciate me. And I can trust my judgment and let good people into my life. Remember to be patient with yourself. These unhealthy core beliefs have been reinforced in your thinking process for years. It will take time and practice to unlearn them. But the brain can change you can relearn healthier ways to think, feel, and act. As you work to reconstruct your core beliefs and learn to influence, direct, and distract your thoughts, you will be better able to manage your emotions and to make healthier choices in your life. There are four values that will help you along this process. Knowledge, strength, courage, and faith. Knowledge. Learn more about our Heavenly Father and Savior, Jesus Christ. Learn more about the plan of happiness and your divine role in that plan. Take time each day to pray, read the scriptures, and talk with trusted friends and family about how they have felt God's love in their lives. Pray for personal revelation to know God's unique plan for you, and pray for guidance to make the right choices to receive the full blessings and infinite potential that God has planned for you. Also, seek knowledge about emotional health and recommendations to address significant concerns. Strength. 
Having to look at yourself in the mirror to examine your character defects and process the hidden parts of you is difficult and sometimes painful. Change is uncomfortable, and sometimes making the right decision for yourself isn't easy. I know that it's difficult, because if it was easy, you would have made the change already. Pray for strength to help you cope with and manage the overwhelming feelings of distress that might come up during the change process. You are stronger than you know. You can do hard things. Courage. Our natural response to pain and discomfort is fear and avoidance. And yet, if we do not change, nothing changes. Have courage to make positive changes in your life that will align you with your divine worth and draw you closer to Heavenly Father. Be brave and honest when examining your core beliefs and automatic thoughts that influence your emotions and behaviors. Faith. Have faith in the healing power of Jesus Christ. Be patient with the process and know that even during the difficult struggles, He is still with you. Keep going. Trust that Heavenly Father has a plan for you. It may not make sense to you in the moment, but take caution not to lean to your own understanding, but trust in His infinite and eternal knowledge. As you make the right decisions, you will feel His love and witness the blessings in your life. I bear my witness that Heavenly Father knows and loves each one of us. Our Savior Jesus Christ lives, and His atoning sacrifice makes the plan of happiness possible. I bear witness that the gospel is true and that Russell M. Nelson is a living prophet of God. I have felt the blessings of our Savior's love in my life, and I testify that as you make choices in your life that align with your divine worth, you will also receive God's choicest blessings. I express my love and aloha to each one of you, and I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.